So thank you everyone for joining us with Stephanie Barnes. Uh, Stephanie is a chief chaos organizer for uh, IntelliKey. She's been a guest uh, presenter for us in the past. We actually go back many years uh, when she was in Toronto leading a KM a working group there. Uh, and we were endorsing that uh, for our students so many years. And now Stephanie's over in Germany doing uh, some KM consulting over there. Uh, she originally brought this up a few months ago. We got really excited about the idea. So we've set up um, actually not only this, this webinar, but uh, she has a, a series of blogs that are coming out as well. Um, the, uh, the first was just released a few weeks ago at our website. If you go to kminstitute.org and the blog section, you'll see Stephanie Barnes' uh, latest over there. And then we'll post another blog here shortly. So, but without further ado, Stephanie, I'll hand it over to you and um, please go ahead and get started. Great. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, so just, I don't know, I have a feeling that there's a lot of people on here that already know who I am, but uh, just a little bit more detail about who I am. Um, I have an undergrad in accounting and an MBA in IT. I've done knowledge management work for 22 years this year. Um, started out at HP and then I've been out as an independent consultant um, for almost 18 years. Well, 18 years this year, but the anniversary is actually in the fall. I am Canadian um, and moved to Berlin five and a half years ago, and I love Berlin. So, um, but yeah, pretty good with the time zones. So if you want to talk, I can find a time to talk. Um, that's it. Anyway, that's enough about me. If you're not connected to me on LinkedIn, feel free to find me on LinkedIn um, and uh, yeah, find me on LinkedIn. So I like to start all my sessions off these days um, with a little, this little exercise, this little activity. So hopefully nobody is driving and you're all safe at home um, in your home office or maybe in your real office um, and someplace quiet and you can get comfortable and um, take a slow, deep breath and close your eyes and picture in your mind's eye a small and delicate flower floating gently inside your skull. Just behind the bone of your forehead. Notice the flower's color, its shape, pattern of its petals. Let the flower drift slowly downward. Gliding gently down your throat into your rib cage. Drifting down and down between your lungs, downward, gently downward, coming to rest in the lowest place in your abdomen. The place where your breath reaches when you breathe fully and deeply. The quiet touch of color deep in the darkness of your abdomen. Hold the flower there. Hold it. Hold it. Now let it go. Let the flower vanish but stay focused on the place where it was, deep down in the dark center of you. Focus on the darkness. Now, when you're ready, and only when you're ready, open your eyes and come back into our virtual room. Okay, thank you. Um, I like to start my sessions off um, with that just because everything is so crazy and chaotic. It just gives us all a minute you know, to center and to get focused on the room, our virtual room and you know, leave behind what, what's gone um, 
before this and what's waiting for us after and, and hopefully just get get focused. So um, yeah, so if you want to share, I'd like to take a, a couple of minutes and, and allow people to reflect. So if you want to share something in the chat window, um, feel free to, to do that. Um, if you want to unmute and share something you know, verbally, um, audibly, um, feel free to do that. Um, yeah, I have have had really nice comments. Um, and Eric, maybe I'm going to ask you to um, keep an eye on the chat. And if, if there's something there that we need to read out or a question or anything, um, I'll, you can feel free to interrupt me and, and ask or, or say what's ever in the chat. OK, great. Um, yeah, so this is that's just a like I say a way to to calm down and center and um, collect ourselves before so we can focus on on what comes next. So for me, I get all excited about all this, so it'll, it also lets me catch my breath <laughs> as as well, which is a good thing. Um, so I'm going. I'm guessing nobody wants to share anything. Okay, I'm um, okay. Um, just interrupt me if if you yeah want to ask something or um, put a question in the chat and, and Eric will interrupt. Um, so we do have a, a Q and A at, at the end as well. So don't worry about that. Anyway, what I want you to know, you know something you probably already know, um, is that what workers want, what knowledge workers want, is all of these things about being more engaged and collaborative and creative. Um, they want to be coached and not managed and seen as individuals, all of these things and, and more. I actually have seen a, a much longer list. I couldn't get it fit on the slide, so I picked out the top ones. Um, all of these things in our, in our organization, even more so now that we're all working remotely and trying to figure out ways to be seen and make a contribution and make sure that, you know, that we're doing what, what we need to do. Um, so we've got the individual on, on one hand. And then we've got the environment that we're in, you know, the, the world that we're living in. And some of you may have heard this term before. It was, an, it was a term that you know, a year ago I hadn't heard of, to be honest. Um, but when I heard it, I was like, oh, yeah, this is, this is us. This is the world, especially the world in the last 14 months, right? Um, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous VUCA. So I, I say um, quite often this VUCA world that we live in and, and how do we deal with this? You know, it's not, it's not sort of, not that the world was ever calm and, you know, peaceful, but, but it was less chaotic certainly than, than it is now, you know, with rules and regulations changing, whether we can go into the office or not go into the office and, you know, what masks we have to wear on public transit and, and all of these things, um, just trying to keep up and, and keep ourselves sane. So, so we've got these needs on one hand and, and this chaos, chaos that we live in, you know, on the other and trying to balance it all and, and not lose our, our minds in the process. And how, how do we do that? That's the question. Um, how do we deal with, with all of this? Um, and I don't know, I like that little owl. He looks like he's asking the question and, and kind of saying, really, are you serious <laughs> at the same time? No, the radical KM is made up of, of all of these things and, and more and, and has come out of 10 years, an idea I had 10 years ago after I did a leadership workshop. And it's, it's been pieces that I have been bringing together um, you know, all of this time and, and the pandemic and everything getting turned upside down and backwards really has a allowed me to put the pieces together in a different way. But it also seems like people are are ready and interested in doing things differently and recognizing that we need to do things differently. So so it still is knowledge management. It's it's um, people process and technology the way that we have always done and known knowledge management. It's just that knowledge management that way just doesn't go quite far enough. We need some tools to help us continue on into, you know, what awaits us, awaits us after the pandemic and even during, you know, the ongoing pandemic and tapping into our creativity and, and our artistic, our inner, our inner artists 
um, and, and helping us to, to not only cope, but to be successful and innovative in our organizations. So like you say, it's about people, process and technology still multiplied by cre creativity because creativity is not additive, it's multiplicative. And, um, and that's what gives us radical knowledge management. So lots of people think when I start talking about radical knowledge management that it somehow isn't that first term that it, the people, process and technology are, are somehow going away, but they're not. Those things are still important. The, the, the technology and the databases collaboration, you know, the, the systems and the lessons learned and on all of that is still really important, but we need to, to be dealing with it differently and, and um, yeah, using it differently within our organizations. So in the, the last, in the past, knowledge management was about lessons learned and communities of practice and documenting knowledge for later retrieval and creating you know all these these um, repositories and collaboration spaces and and using technology to to help us do all of these things and that still is important but it's not as important because things are changing so quickly um, and constantly that we need some different tools to help us deal with the present and the future help us deal with that uncertainty help us deal with the continuous learning that that's necessary to, to cope and to be successful. Something that allows us um, to explore travel trial and error um, and just and that feeds into the continuous learning you know so questions become more important than the answers um, and just things to do to adopt to our ever-changing environment. We really need the space to be creative and analytical. We focus so much on the analytical. It's time to bring in some creativity to help us deal with with all of the things that are going on. And creativity is what differentiates us from AI. You know, people talk all about AI and the technology, and that's good and it's useful. And and I'm not saying that it's not, but our creativity is what differentiates us. Now we need to keep that in mind and help people tap into that and and to relearn it. And, and we need to relearn it because it's been educated out of us. We focus so much on the, on the analytical and I'm guilty of it too. I have an undergrad in accounting and an MBA in IT. I focused on you know those things, those were gonna get me a good job, doing things that I, I liked or loved. Um, I can't say that I loved accounting, <laughs> which is why I switched, um, but, but I, you know, I love the, the business IT alignment work that I have done. Um, in KM and helping people be more successful with, with their KM. And, but over the last 10 years, I've found that it just isn't, isn't enough and that people have forgotten how to be creative and how to continuously learn. And we need to stop treating knowledge and our organizations like there's some kind of production line or on a, a knowledge production line. Knowledge doesn't work that way, as I'm sure everybody on this call knows. Knowledge is social, it wants to be shared, it wants to be evolved and developed and, and not sit in a repository someplace going stale um, for somebody to look at in 10 years and go, do we need this anymore? Um, why is this still here? You know, I found this, but I don't think it's right. Um, we need to, to tap into things and, and start asking more questions and being more creative about our approach to, to knowledge in our organizations. Research says that, create backs me up on this, that, that creativity is absolutely something that we all have. Um, when we're five years old, the bottom point is five-year-olds, more than 90% of them demonstrated the creativity to suggest new and innovative ways of looking at situations. I'm sure if some of you have kids or maybe nieces and nephews the way I have, or you know, the kids, kids of friends, um, you'll know that kids come up with the craziest things and then you go, oh, but wait, um, <laughs> that's actually a really interesting way to look at the problem and, and a different way to approach a solution. By the time we're 17, though, we've lost 80% of that. So only 10% of 17-year-olds. And by the time they're 18 and, and older, so all of us on this call, are probably only using 5% of our, our creativity. Um, 
and so how a how sad is that that we've we've lost that and and you know pushed to have great jobs and great educations and we've lost our creativity but how sad is that that we're not bringing that to our organizations and and helping our organizations and the people around us um, have a better experience um this is a quote from Brene Brown that you may be um, familiar with. The part I want to focus on is the, the part at the bottom, you know, the 50% of pe those people that say the shame wounds um, were around creativity. So not only is it educated out of us, we're, we're shamed. You know, people, I include myself in this group, had someone in a teacher, you know, in middle school tell me, you know, criticize my, my drawing. And that was the end of it. You know, I'm not sure that I would have been any kind of an artist, although I certainly have an artistic practice now and have sold things. Um, but that put it away, you know, from the time I was 13 until I was uh, over 40, <laughs> um, till I tapped into it again, um, and thought, you know, and, and it totally shifted the way that I have thought about things. So this is some of what we need to come over and that, but that shaming also transfers over into other things. Um, so, and that's one of the things I like about the creativity workshops that I do is to see people have that shift and, and go, Oh, the floor doesn't open up and swallow me whole when I get Brown in my yellow. Um, this is, you know, this is okay. I can do this. And so that, that confidence trickles over into other aspects of, of their life when they realize, well, maybe I, it worked out okay this time. I'm going to try it again. So, and then this is a quote from um, Matisse that I found. And I, and I, every time I read it, I think these are so the people that I want in my organization. So the people that I want to work with as a consultant, you know, people that are curious and flexible that don't get caught into, well, this is what the plan says, you know, and we have to do it exactly how the plan goes. Plans never work out. It's good to have a plan, um, but don't get too caught up in it. So be curious and, and have, you know, a spirit and be playful about finding the solution and finding a way to it through things um, rather than yeah, being too dogmatic about, about things. I'm going to take a breath here. I can see a couple of um, bubbles on the, the chat. Erica, I'm just going to check in and make sure that there's nothing that should be interjected at, at this point. Yeah, I, I don't think so. I think we can wait till toward the end. Um, okay. if, if you don't mind scrolling back up through the chat, I'll be happy to point out a, a, a key question or two that needs addressed, uh, it, okay. it's not just comments. Okay, okay, good. Just wanted to check in. Um, so this work is important because it, it allows us to experiment to come out of our, our boxes and our comfort zones. And, and I get that people really like their comfort zones. They're nice, it's warm, it's cozy in there. Um, but it's so, it's so freeing and liber liberating to come out of that, that box and, and try something new. I know that it's scary, but I know that it's also confidence building and liberating and all kinds of other wonderful things um you know that it's really important and and it's interesting when i do these workshops and these activities even when it's in you know or especially when it's in a, a strategy workshop or a requirements analysis workshop to use some of these activities and get people thinking differently about what the possible solution is and what the possible you know desired outcome is and challenging some assumptions and and the status quo um, and really coming up with some new and creative, innovative um, solutions to old problems. It gives us a, a voice. All too often, people hold things back because they're afraid to, you know, that they're going to be laughed at or they're going to be told no, you know. So, but tapping into this and it gives us a voice and gives us the confidence to say, you know what, I've had this idea. What does anybody, what does everybody else think? And sharing it. Um, lots of times somebody else will say, oh yeah, I thought of that too, or what about this? And, and you build on each other's um, comments and, and questions and find something that, that really is um, going to solve the problem in a different way. It helps us redirect and, and release 
energy um, and release stress, which is good as you know, I think we're all a little bit stressed more than normal these days. Um, so anything that releases some stress and improves our focus is a good thing. Improving our resiliency um, is, is definitely a good thing. So tapping into our creativity and, and, and letting it out into the world um, helps with, with all of these things and helps us be our whole selves in, in our organizations. And it, we're, so then we're being our authentic whole self, which is what the new work stuff talks about, bringing our whole self to work. And we find opportunities to build the skills for our own leadership, but also leadership within others by giving them the space, the space to ask questions and to explore ideas and come up with solutions and to, to implement and execute those problem, those solutions to the problems. So now I'm going to take a little break, I think pause and ask you to get a piece of paper, just uh, anything. If it's a note, if you have a notebook, we can use, you can use a page in a notebook. If you've got a printer beside you, like I do, you can pull a piece of paper out of your um, paper drawer. I have a, a lined pad of paper here beside me. You just need a piece of paper um, and a pen, a pencil, um, I have markers on my desk because <laughs> I'm me. Um, I also have a highlighter on my desk, anything that'll make a mark. I'm gonna use a pen. No, I'm gonna use this pen. I like this pen. It's got four colors of ink in it. Um, and so you're gonna take the paper, maybe push your laptop. I'm gonna push my laptop in a bit. So I got a bit of room. I can put the piece of paper in front of my laptop. You're gonna take your pen in whatever hand you need to put your pen in or your pencil in and hold it over the paper and make a scribble, just a quick scribble, whatever, don't think about it, just do it. Whatever, whatever your hand wants to do, make a scribble. I'll hold mine up, you can see mine on the screen, hopefully. And then I'm going to, and, I, and all of you are gonna take your piece of paper and turn it around and look at it from all different sides and decide which um, orientation feels like the right, the right way. Um, and then you're gonna add another line to it. You don't have to close your eyes this time, just add an embellishment to it. Um, and then, Turn it around again, see if you want to reorient it or keep it the direction that, that it already was. Um, and add, let's see, a third line to it. Um, and add, we want to do this six times. So we've got three. Now add some more embellishments. Um, you can maybe do some shading if you want. That's four. Um, another one. That's five. And a last one to finish it off. For six. Okay, I'm gonna hold up my picture. You don't have to hold your picture up. There's mine. It's just about getting out of your head for, for a minute, um, or for a few minutes. And it doesn't need to look like anything. Lots of people do these in workshops. Um, lots of times people just throw them in the garbage on the way out, um, which is fine because it's just about, like the screen says, um, bring up the mind to, to think. So just getting out of your head for a minute, stop being so analytical and, and things. And, and yeah, and that's, that's it. As you can see, I do these all the time, even on my, on my own when I'm trying to get something done and, and stuck. I'm gonna take it just to prove that it doesn't need to be you know, put up on the fridge or anything. I'm gonna throw it away. <laughs> um, so it's done. I uh, would we'll take a second and, and um, reflect on that. So if you want to unmute and share what you thought of that, 
activity. Um, take yourself off mute, or you can put something in the chat, and we can can share it later on um, when we do the Q and A at, at the end. Um, yeah, lots of people yeah get concerned about making marks on paper, and that has to look like something. Um, and it doesn't, it's just about putting the marks on the paper and, and getting out of our heads for a minute. Anything that needs to be said? Anybody want to share? Take yourself off mute. I think it was a great experience just to be able to do that in a non charted way. You know, you're always trying to get everything in the to do list or whatever it is, and just, just scribbling for no reason is nice. Yeah, thanks. I'm glad you liked it. It is. We are, like you said, we're always so structured and, you know, it's got to have a purpose. And the purpose in this case is just to have a bit of fun and, and to not have a purpose <laughs> for a few minutes. Thank you, Leslie. Anybody else want to reflect? Yeah, I thought it was... Um... It was really good. It felt so good. I mean, listening to you talk about the creativity piece um, really struck a chord with me because last night I left with a work assignment and I was seeing it one way and I was so blocked. Um, and, I, and then I thought, you know, the day is going to get really hot. So I went for an early walk, a really quick one. Yeah. And, and it just freed me up. And I thought, ah, I'm fussing about this. But, you know, there's an opportunity here. And suddenly it popped very different. Yep. And just now I was like, you know, trying to multitask, I'll confess. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and listening to you and doing things. And I thought, okay, okay I'll stop and scribble. But it was so freeing. And, and just for a moment, you know, it, it gives you back the clarity and maybe the space you need sometimes to step away from projects you're working on. Yeah. And then in that, when that space opens up, then the other ideas kind of pop up. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Thank you, Denise. Yeah, I did these at uh, a session a few months ago and, and somebody had been struggling with a branding problem. And, and, you know, she said after the scribble drawing and, and the reflection, like we did like this, and she's like, oh, I've got a solution to this branding problem that I've been having for months, you know, and just by opening up the space, you know, and doing something as silly as, as scribbling for a couple of minutes. So, yeah, thank you. So, okay, moving on. So what happens when we bring in our inner, inner artists? You know, that was a little warm up for, for bringing in our inner artists. And, and this is a model that comes from a book called Creative Company um, that a couple of people that I, I know I'm connected with here in Germany wrote, um, Dirk Dobe and, and Thomas Copeland. And I'm not gonna talk about the whole model. That's a whole other, <laughs> a whole other thing, a whole other day. Um, but what I do want to focus on is this part on the, the bottom right, the artistic attitude and artistic practice and bringing what happens when we bring what those two terms mean and what happens when we bring that into our organizations. So artistic attitude and, and artistic practices are about these behaviors. So the attitudes of having being curious, being passionate about what we're doing, being confident, being resilient, you know, so when it doesn't work, we get up and try again, um, taking what we've learned from, from that one that didn't work. Um, and I don't like to say failure. It just didn't work the way that we expected it to work. But hopefully we've learned something and we can adapt our, our you know, process going forward um, and be get towards we want, where we want to be with it. So um, gives us that, that resilience. Um, the artistic practice is around perception, reflection, play, performance, it always reminds me of a plan, do, check, act, you know, kind of cycle. It's that standing back and looking at what's, what's happening, what the problem is, what the situation is, reflecting on it, what, you know, what do we know, what questions can we ask, what things can we maybe try out, you know, in the, the play phase, and then performing it, sharing it with, with others, whether that's our boss or our, our project team or, or whoever that, that is performing it, taking the feedback from that performance and feeding back into that perception reflection play cycle again. So that's all. And, and in the workshops I do, um, I use art. <laughs> I, I, I talk about these things and we do, we do things like the scribble drawing, we paint, 
and we do all kinds of things but tying it back into this and tying this it back into then how do we does that do these behaviors and attitudes transfer over to our organization the painting is is, is part of, is a metaphor um, for all of this and allows us to to experiment in in a in a different way than sitting playing with a, a spreadsheet and a computer um, and it allows us to tap into our creativity and, and those things that, you know that that stuff that we don't use all the time so these are just a few of the ways that we can become more creative playing doing arts and crafts exercising improvise doing improv um, I like to do improv in, in some of the workshops and things that I do. Again, it gets people out of the box, out of their comfort zones um, and thinking about things a little bit differently. Even just things as basic as getting enough sleep makes a difference in our, our creativity. Um, drinking consciously, meeting new people, having conversations, um, learning about what they're doing, um, you know, all those things, just doing something different. And every time I look at the slide, I realize I've forgotten to put in gardening and cooking because those are two things that make you focus on what you're doing, you know, in this moment. Like Denise said, she stopped and, and scribbled with us, you know, a minute ago, stopped multitasking and, and focused on what we were doing because, because you need to focus. You can't multitask and, and scribble. You can't multitask and cook. Well, if you do, you probably end up with something burnt on the stove <laughs> which isn't really that good um, so yeah all of these things help us tap into our, our creativity it's not as much as I like the arts and crafts part of things and um, it's not just about arts and crafts at all so um, and why now why is this stuff important now because of all of these things agile design thinking new work just even being sustainable, not just in our organizations, it's not just about, you know, recycling and, and reusing things, um, but it's about sustainability from a human perspective. How can we cope better in, in our organizations and, and think with things like COVID and, and you know, whatever comes next um, after we're, we're through this. And um, what struck me about it is, is all of those things, all of those things, are looking for the same kinds of behaviors um, in order to be successful and to to um, yeah move forward. And there and that's all of these behaviors: um, having a sustainable mindset, a, the sense of purpose, keeping things simple. Um, I'm not going to read the whole list to you. You can read it while I'm talking here. But but when I dug into them, I'm like, these are all. All the same underlying behaviors. Agile wants these kinds of behaviors. Design thinking wants these kinds of behaviors. New work wants these kinds of behaviors. Um, and where do all these behaviors come from? They come out of tapping into our creativity. We're missing them in our organizations because we've said, no, we only allow the rational and the logical and the analytical in our organizations. And we're missing out. We're missing out on a big piece of the puzzle and we need to tap back into our creativity and bring that, that in and share that in our organizations. Um, and that's why it's time for radical knowledge management. Um, it seems fitting that radical knowledge management comes out of the chaos that is the, the pandemic um, and, and bringing more balance and bringing more creativity back in. And, um, there are case studies about organizations that have done things with creativity. Those are a few of them. Um, the one, my favorite one at the moment is the Danish government one at the top because it was actually a knowledge management program that implemented the studio space um, for bringing in teams to um, collaborate and learn to certain aspect of it was team building, but also around knowledge creation and collaboration and problem solving um, and they were so successful with this, this program. It ran for two years until they changed offices and the, the, the office moved to a new location and they didn't have space, unfortunately. But, but in the two years that they ran this program, it was so successful and they came up with so many innovative ways to find solutions to their problems. Um, so you know, there, there are absolutely examples out there of companies that, that have embraced creativity. Um, they may not have called it radical knowledge management, um, but they have brought creativity into, the, into their organizations. 
Now, I'm going to take a breath. We've got lots of time for some Q&A. Um, I've got a few more slides and we're going to do a poll in a minute, but I want to give you a chance to um, come off of mute if you want to, or put the, your questions in the chat window. Um, and yeah, and we'll, we'll do some Q&A right now. Anybody brave enough to ask a question? Got any questions? Does all make sense? Hi, Stephanie, my name is Lit. Um, I just want to know your perspective, right? How different is radical knowledge management to radical innovation? Um, I don't know because I this is the first time I have heard of radical innovation, to be honest. <laughs> so I'm afraid <laughs> I can't give you an answer. Can you tell or can you tell me a little bit about radical innovation? And then maybe I um, I'm asking sorry, did someone else speak? No, I don't think so. Yeah, okay. So I asked that because um, personally in my organization, they, there's a lot of emphasis on innovation management where they talk about radical innovative researchers. And essentially that falls under what my team does, which is knowledge management. Right. And what we do is we incorporate creative practices to improvise our current knowledge management um, tools and activities that we have. So relating back to one of your slides where you had the formula on PPT plus creativity equals to radical knowledge management, mm -hmm. I guess that's where I was trying to draw the link. Um, are they essentially the same? But um, yeah, that was just my thought process. Okay, I think from what you've described that you're doing radical knowledge management and I didn't know you were doing radical knowledge management. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is why I was just wondering like, so am I actually doing radical knowledge management right now? <laughs> I think you are. <laughs> well done. We should talk later. <laughs> yeah, no, it sounds like you're, if you're using arts-based um, interventions in your KM program, I would definitely say that, that that's what you're doing. So it's thank you. Looks like we might have a question from Lauren Dorr. Okay. Lauren, you wanna go ahead and unmute? Okay. Hi. Yes, hopefully this isn't too echoey. Um, I very much appreciate this and come from a creative background as well. And a couple of things I was wondering about is who generally is your audience that you do this kind of work with? And I would, I've worked with different groups that sometimes even trying a different way of thinking about things creates resistance and some people are more open to it. So if you talk a little bit about, is also this part of what you're presenting as part of your consulting work um, from the beginning. Yeah, so do you mean like, is it the sales or the marketing teams or like that within the organization? Who am I working with or? To some extent, and, you know, are you doing it like senior management or you oh. it could be marketing or could be um, marketing and whatever group, maybe they, maybe it's creative and marketing and how they can work together or, uh, does it work with a bunch of different groups? Do you do those groups separately? Yeah, so I usually come in with um, through with the KM program as part of the, the you know an activity that the knowledge management program is is doing. So, um, but then when they bring me in, it can be it can be IT, it can be marketing, it can be HR. Um, sometimes in some cases, it's not um, KM that's brought me in. It's it's um, HR that's brought me in. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's all, I do tend to focus on having one group. So it'll be all IT people or all be marketing people or, you know, some, some team or some group within the organization that's identified, um, doing this, the creativity work as, as important, um, for them. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't think I've answered your question fully, but can you, can you help me out? <laughs> um, what what um, aspect haven't I answered? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Because I've um, sort of related. One time I worked with a with, you know, across an organization where we were trying to do something a little creative and the salespeople kind of like, nope, that, that, that's not how it's going to work. You know, that's not how we're going to use this. And everybody else was saying, oh, I can see how we could change things. So I think there can be resistance. It can depend upon how the activity is 
sold, or I think sometimes if I'm in sale, I don't want to maybe feel vulnerable in front of the creative people or marketing. So I'm just curious how you um, work with different groups or bring them down. I think maybe sometimes people feel more comfortable with their own group, and sometimes they feel comfortable being trying to be quote unquote creative. They feel uh, first conscious. Yeah, it just depends on on the organization. Um, a lot of times they the IT people would rather work together. Um, although um, once in a while, somebody's, you know, like you say, conscientious about or self-conscious about, well, I don't want to look silly in front of my my colleagues, you know, in front of people I know I would rather do it with a team that I, I don't know. Um, and we usually work through that. Um, it's important to meet people where they are. Um, you know, I did have somebody walk into a workshop once and see all the paint and art supplies on the table and, you know, make like he was going to leave again. <laughs> and it was like, I didn't know that I, this is what I signed up for. Um, we had a conversation about it, you know, off to the side before the workshop got started. And, and I invited him to stay and, and try to address some of his, his concerns and his, his hesitancies about it. And in the end, he had a great workshop. Um, had some breakthrough moments um, for sure and and was really glad that, that he stayed but he needed some some extra attention um, at the start just to kind of get him over that that yeah that fear that hesitancy of you're going to make me paint um, so yeah in the end he had a great time and took his painting home and hung it up on his living room wall but you, you definitely have to make it safe and you have to meet people where they are like we have Anybody a else? Yep. hand raised by Monica. She wants to ask a question. Okay. Monica? You just have to unmute Monica if you want to go ahead and ask. There we go. Uh, hello, can you hear me? I can. Hi. Yes, I'm not sure if my question is related with the last one, but okay, uh, in many companies, there are a group of people dedicated to knowledge management and another group dedicated, dedicated to innovation management. What do you think to integrate those groups, uh, for example, in knowledge and innovation management? Yes, absolutely. I think that's exactly what should happen. And that, that case study that I mentioned, the um, this Danish government one, that's exactly what they had done. They combined their innovation management and their knowledge management groups um, ah, okay. to, to uh -huh. do that. So, okay. yeah, yes. yeah. And a lot of times, a lot of times, especially early on the, the groups that I worked with, the KM group had been tasked with innovation. And um, so that was what, what you know, brought me in with them. So yeah, I think that's a good combination. Okay. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Anybody else? There's another question popping up in chat. And okay. Stephanie, if you're not able to view your chat, I'll be happy to read the question out loud. Yeah, you've got it in front of you. So go ahead and read it out loud. Okay. Uh, from Andrew. And uh, it was, uh, so, uh, let's see, Rafada said, I second your question, Mr. Andrew. So it's picking up some interest. Is one of the concerns looking forward as to how people can be creative when some are you having to use technology to connect, to brainstorm using tools like Miro or Miro? Um, no, I think I think the technology adds an extra layer or complicating factor to it. Um, for sure, if people aren't comfortable with tools like Miro, and and I will admit that I have used Miro, but I'm not a big fan of Miro. Um, I have a tendency, maybe I'm just too old, I have a tendency to still do things offline and, and draw things offline. And then I'll transfer it to um, Miro after I have it worked out in my head how I want it to look like. Um, so I'm not, I will freely admit that I'm not, um, yeah, good at, adept, particularly adept at, at brainstorming um, on Miro as a, as a first go. Um, this, and the stuff that I do, I, you know, I encourage people to, to do it the way that they're comfortable with. Um, so when a lot of, even doing the, the creativity workshops and things that I do remotely, we do it analog, honestly. I think that there's a lot to learn by doing it analog and not getting caught up in the technology. Um, the technology is useful. I'm not 
I'm not saying that it's not, and there's a time and a place for it, but I think that there's also a time and a place to do things analog. And particularly when we're talking about um, painting and, and tapping into our creativity and relearning our creativity and the, the exercises I do with, with that and, and the arts, um, there's some real advantage to doing it offline. We're, on, we're online, we're on Zoom, much like we are now, but Zoom isn't the focus. The technology isn't the focus. We're, we've got our canvases and our paint and, and Zoom is just there kind of watching and, and we're doing it here. And so I think that there's a, a balance that needs to be found um, with using the technology um, and not letting it become a hindrance to us being creative and, and you know, and it actually facilitating and, and helping us solve the problem. So you now I know I've done um, planned workshops with colleagues and, and we've actually, we've used Miro, but the step before Miro was what I described was taking, you know, a pad of paper and writing stuff all out on, on our pads of paper, on our sheets of paper and organizing it on our our desks and then transferring, taking pictures and transferring the photos up to Miro and, and then organizing it and, and coalescing the ideas that way. Um, so a kind of a hybrid. Does that answer the, your question? Yes, yes, thanks, uh, Stephanie, it does. I mean, I'm still old fashioned. I still have, um, in fact, I always kept... Oh, you've gone on mute. Um, sorry, I still use a good, a good solid pencil, and I'm writing my notes to this one using a fountain pen, which will go into something technological at due course. Yeah, yeah, I'm much like you, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> so, but there's something to be to be said for that. Like I said, was saying with the the painting, people have asked me to do you know digital painting, and and I can, but. A, well, then we get caught up in the technology, but there's also this undo button. So they get make a mistake and they hit undo, and and so the 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 mistake, if you want to call it a mistake, disappears. But when we're actually putting paint on the canvas, then and you get brown and you're yellow. Well, then you got brown and you're yellow, and and how do we go forward? Um, you know, do we rush right in and make it worse, or do we let it dry and and think about how to address the brown and the yellow and, and incorporate that into our picture going forward. And, and so there's, there's a real benefit to saying, no, you know what, I need to step back from this now and, and draw rather than the immediacy of, of oh, no, I'm just gonna hit undo and go on. So anybody else got some questions, comments, concerns? Like Sabine might have a question. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I was just wondering, um, in terms of KM, what, when you look at um, sort of the solutions that come out of this increased creativity approach, does it sort of um, target specific areas of KM or like that you find that certain areas of, of KM are especially benefit from this i don't know like aspects concerning how people connect to each other or uh how they how they share things or how they um deal with the uh document uh storage or whatever so i was just wondering whether there are certain areas that you think benefit especially from this yeah i think it comes up on the the more people centric mm -hmm. Side. So the, the communities of practice work and the lessons learned and, and the collaboration, you know, for sure, and how people work together, building trust. It's, it's some of the activities are really good for building trust and teamwork and, and things. It's interesting to use them as a, as a tool in trying to solve some of the technology, come up with, you know, technology solutions, you know, and helping people think differently than rather, you know, throwing another database at, at it. Not that in some cases, a, you know, the database isn't going to be a solution, but but maybe a different approach to it, a different approach to the taxonomy or the ontology and how that the metadata and how that's organized and how it's used, you know, and what users would actually, what technology actually benefits the, the um, users and, and helps their jobs to be easier. So yeah, but definitely on the people side. 
Thanks. You're welcome. Anybody else? Leslie had a, uh, there's a nice comment here in chat. I can share with you real quick from Leslie. Having kids that have grown up on iPads, I still make them disconnect my music or arts, but most of new generations have lost that analog side. I think it's brilliant to try to integrate this into a corporate organization. Thank you. Yeah, it, it is so sad that the kids have lost this. And, and I was watching a, a documentary um, a few weeks ago called Drops of Joy and it, um, filmed in Brazil, uh, the documentary was. And so one of the people they interviewed was, was this teacher and, and she said, you know, she can ask her students whether they would rather go outside and play or whether they would rather go to the mall. And all the kids said they would rather go to the mall. And, and she was so sad, I was so sad to, to hear this because play, which feeds into this, is so important to, to how we learn as children, but, but also for, for adults. And that's why you're seeing things like Lego Serious Play and, and certainly the work that I do you know, with the painting and the creativity comes into that. And, and it's, it's a way to help us cope and, and to learn and move forward. And it's so sad that the kids are caught up in the technology of it. And you know, yeah, I, I had a friend post on um, Facebook, he was babysitting his two-year-old grandson and the grandson came over and took his iPhone and scrolled through it and found Netflix and then went into Netflix and found, I forget now which cartoon it was, but found the, the cartoon that he wanted to watch on Netflix and sat down and watched Netflix on his grandfather's phone. <laughs> and uh, like, oh my God, A, how does a two-year-old do that? Although I know how two-year-old does that, but how sad that they didn't go to the box of toys, you know, and pull out some bricks or some blocks to play with and make noise with and and yeah that they wanted to sit down with the phone but anyway i digress <laughs> um, any other any other questions comments eric in the chat we're all good okay so um a couple of polls here or not a couple of polls uh one poll with two questions sorry three questions <laughs> i'm gonna launch it here and so you can see them so as Eric mentioned at the top, um, he was really excited about my Radical KM idea. I'm really excited about my Radical KM idea. So we're just trying to gauge, you know, interest in, in the idea um, around maybe some courses or yeah, just what. So we've got three questions here for you. Um, would you be interested in taking a short course, like a two or three hour course on Radical KM? Um, it would be, so you can say yes, self-paced, yes, virtual live, um, or no thanks. Um, then the, the next question is, um, would you be interested in a course where you could become certified in radical knowledge management? So a two or three day course um, and some different options on yes or a no thanks. And then the third one, um, if we did a certification course, and held it virtually, which it would probably be since I'm in Berlin, would you prefer it to be an all day, every day kind of thing, consecutive days? So if it was a three day course, it would be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for eight hours, or would you rather have it broken down into smaller pieces? So we did four hours um, for eight consecutive Mondays, say, or, or um, three consecutive, uh, I'm losing count of my days. Um, four, yeah, four consecutive Mondays or, you know, one up, but half a day for once a week for, for a few weeks. Um, so consecutive days, all days or, and broken down. Oh, we got even split on that one. <laughs> That's good to know. Um, yeah. So if you can just give us a little bit of data so we can figure out what we might do next besides, I think we're going to do another webinar, right? In the, in a month or so, Eric. To go with my other great and go with my other blog post um so you don't have to have been at this one to go to the next one certainly although obviously all of you are here and you're welcome to come to the next one it will be different um so have some different things about how it incorporates in in management i'll talk a bit more about some of the case studies and, and things that are out there um so yeah looks like we've got a good number of people voting so that's great thank you so much for doing that um 
I give, can, should we end the poll, do you think, Eric? Okay, so I'm ending the poll. Thank you, everybody. Um, I am going to close that for now. And that's my contact information. If anybody wants to reach out and connect with me, um, I'll put that back up in a minute, but there's a book list here. Um, some of the books that I have used that have informed my thinking about this, um, this topic and putting these pieces together. Um, so again, you can reach out to me, I'll send you this. Um, some ways to activate your creativity, a couple of short online courses that I did. Um, the mindfulness one I did with a, a friend in Canada who's also another KM person. Um, and so we did this mindfulness through art one um, and then virtual work, virtual meetings one and then yeah, the radical KM stuff at the end. So, and then I'll go back to my um, contact information if somebody want, if anybody wants to take a screenshot of that to connect with me later on um you're welcome to do that and yeah i think that's it right eric thank you stephanie yeah this is great uh just a reminder that uh, we are recording this so we'll have this available for you uh, but also uh, by registering uh we hope you're interested in more information on on radical km and so um we'd like to notify you of any upcoming events any occurrences that will happen whether it's a, a new course that's going to be announced or the next webinar uh, if it's anything to do with KM, Radical KM, we'll keep you posted on that. Great. And thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you, everyone. And thanks again, Stephanie. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.